Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. All my day. In the months of July and September 1940, the French historian and future resistance fighter Marc Bloch, who fought in World War I and World War II, wrote a short book called Le Etrange Defait, or Strange Defeat. It was a searing condemnation of the French high command and political class, which was responsible for the humiliating defeat and disintegration of the French army with the Nazi invasion of France. Bloch, who went underground to fight the Nazi occupiers, was executed by the Gestapo in 1944. His book, published after the war, was the model for historian Andrew Bacevich's own book, After the Apocalypse. In his book, Bloch wrote, Our war, up to the very end, was a war of old men, or of theorists who were bogged down in errors, engendered by the faulty teaching of history. It was saturated by the smell of decay. Basevich is no less censorious of the political and military class that has led the United States into one debacle after the next since Vietnam, a war he served in as a young officer. He argues the ruling elites are woefully out of touch with reality, crippled by self-delusion, and unable to adapt to a changing world. Unless they are wrenched from power, he argues, the twilight of the American empire, the one that will be filled, especially given our refusal to seriously address the climate change with catastrophe after catastrophe. Joining me to discuss his book, After the Apocalypse, is retired Army Colonel Andrew Basevich, also an emeritus professor of history and international relations at Boston University. He is the co-founder and president of the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft. So uh, as somebody who writes polemics, uh, I love your book. Uh, but you, uh, very early on, you, you, you talk about the four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, rancor, pestilence, want, and fury uh, comprising our own homemade apocalypse. Just uh, explain, flesh that out. Well, I wrote this during the early stages of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, uh, which was in and of itself, of course, a disturbing event, not only disturbing in the, uh, the havoc it, it wreaked in American society, but also, of course, the ineptitude uh, with which the government authorities responded. But at the same time, uh, evidence of the climate crisis was becoming impossible to ignore. And at the same time, of course, uh, many factors, but primarily the pandemic, were, were cr creating enormous damage uh, in the economy, with millions of Americans uh, thrown out of work, unable to support themselves. My focus for the past 20 years or so, I guess, has been on the failures of U.S. national security policy. And it just seemed to me that, that these other events occurring on top of our abysmal military record showed that something was fundamentally amiss with our country and what we imagined ourselves to be and what we actually were. So it was in that mood uh, that I wrote the book. Very early on, you talk about Madeleine Albright, uh, and this is a quote that she made on the Today Show. If we have to use force, it is because we are America. We are the indispensable nation. We stand tall and we see further than other countries into the future. And then you write, four days after Albright spoke, the World Islamic Front proclaimed a jihad against Jews and crusaders. Co-authored by Osama bin Laden, then an obscure militant Islamist, that document identified the expulsion of U.S. forces from the Arabian Peninsula as a moral imperative requiring the support of Muslims worldwide. Here beckoned the actual future, one to which Albright and other members of the foreign policy establishment would remain steadfastly oblivious 
until the World Trade Center collapsed in a pile of smoke and debris and dust. I, I want to talk about that disconnect because it's a constant theme in the book, which I think would go by the name self-delusion on the part of the military and political elite and how disconnected it is from the actual reality they're confronting. Well, I, I, maybe I'm a little unfair in uh, singling out Madeleine Albright uh, for treatment in the book. But I do think that she embodied, and that particular infamous quote embodies, a mindset that, that permeates the political establishment and really reaches beyond the political establishment uh, into intellectual and media circles. What's the essence of the view? The essence of the view is that that we define the future, uh, that 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 we are called upon to to shape the the future, and of course, inevitably, to shape it in our own image. When I state it so baldly, uh, it sounds preposterous. You know, when I when I state it that way, no significant figure, I think, in our in our public life is going to say, "Yeah, that's what I believe." But regardless of their denials, that is what our elites believe. And, and their particular reading of history uh, affirms their view that we are the indispensable nation. Uh, and then when, that when we use force, uh, it is necessarily pursuant to a righteous cause. And therefore, they remain blind uh, to the faults uh, that 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 lead to uh, so much suffering, catastrophe, you know, missed opportunities uh, that, uh, in my reading, have come to be particularly common since o o o over the last uh, twenty or twenty-five years. Well, as you point out in the book, it's a very selective use of history, uh, because in order to perpetuate that idea you have to whitewash or essentially erase huge parts of American history. You're absolutely right. It's, it's, there's a paradox here or a contradiction that I think is difficult to, uh, to pull apart. You know, on the one hand, uh, it is certainly the case today that American history as, as written by professional historians as studied in our colleges and universities, uh, is a warts in all chronicle. Nothing is hidden. No nothing is off limits. Uh, and yet, on the other hand, that history, the warts in all history, seems to figure only marginally, if at all, in our, in our politics. Uh, and, 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 and we, mu we much prefer the sanitized, uh, version, the heroic version, uh, the, the version that I think more than anything else, uh, centers on the way we choose to remember World War II and the way we choose to remember the role that the United States played in World War II. And I phrase it that way because the way we choose to remember is uh, radically at odds uh, with what actually occurred. You have this juxtaposition, which you note in the book, uh, between uh, states like Texas that are uh, removing uh, texts and uh, historical accounts uh, that challenge that kind of mythic narrative, but you also are, I think, disturbed by things like the 1619 Project done by the New York Times. Can you talk about that juxtaposition, those two polar ends? Well, I have a bias in favor of historical revisionism. Uh, I think revisionism is uh, inevitable. I think it's essential. I think that the history that we need is a history that reflects our perspective 
you know, the perspective of living in the, in the early decades of the 21st century. So in that sense, uh, you know, sign me up for welcoming uh, the 1619 Project. But I just happen to think that the interpretation that the 1619 Project presents is deeply flawed and therefore not particularly helpful. Uh, so it's, it's revisionism of the wrong sort. Uh, and, and in that sense, I think that it actually is a missed opportunity. Ex expound upon that. Revisionism of the wrong sort. What do you mean? Here, here's my interpretation of the 1619 Project, and I'll, 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 I'll lay it out, uh, granting uh, that it may not be what the, uh, the people who created this project, undertook this project, what they themselves mean uh, by what they have accomplished. But I take it to mean that uh, the American story centers on race. Uh, that the American story centers on, on racism. Uh, and not for a second would I wish to marginalize the importance of race in, her, in our story. But I think to put it at the, at the center of things, and by implication exclude other aspects of our founding and of our uh, national existence, I think it. I think it goes too far, and therefore is not helpful. Now, I guess. I guess my critique, if we want to call it that, is informed by content, my own contemporary concerns. Uh, I have come to believe, particularly I think since the end of the Cold War, that. There is no operative definition of the common good uh, to which we as Americans subscribe. And I think that absence uh, is in many respects at the root of why our democracy has deteriorated so badly, uh, again, roughly since the end of the Cold War. And I, I fear that the interpretation of the 1619 project of our past simply will will reinforce that uh, i mean my bottom line is unless we can recover some shared understanding of the common good then american democracy may well be doomed uh, i'm not predicting that i just fear that to be fair to the disenfranchised which were not just african americans but Native Americans, women, men without property, the common good as it was conceived of at the inception of the nation didn't apply to them. Oh, I, I'm with you. Uh, the, the, my, my argument is not, uh, you know, let's, let's roll back to the, uh, to the traditional story of, the, of, the, of these white guys uh, gathered in, uh, in independence in, in the summer of 1776, uh, you know, declaring that all men are created equal. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's complicated. Uh, it's necessary to acknowledge the complications. It's not useful to, to eliminate one set of distortions by then embracing another set of distortions. Well, we'll do another show on that. Um, I want to ask you about, uh, I thought you made some really great points in this book. Uh, but one of them for me that was particularly interesting was how uh, you write the Trump presidency signified the final demise of what you call the new order. And you talked about the kind of crazy conspiratorial right wing as, as uh, embracing a heresy that terrified the established elites, the Bidens, the Clintons, the Bushes and everyone else. Can you explain that? Well, I think in simplest terms, it's the heresy of, uh, of America first. Uh, this, this goes back again to World War II, more specifically to the origins of U.S. In involvement in World War II. The great debate that occurred over a period of a couple of years prior to the Japanese bombing of Pearl Harbor, 
that debate centered on whether or not the United States should intervene uh, in the European war, specifically on behalf of Great Britain, Britain, which after the fall of France that we alluded to early on, uh, stood alone uh, against Hitler's uh, Third Reich. Uh, that, that debate occurred at a pivotal moment of, of U.S. history and resonated for decades after that. And the, and the prevailing interpretation among historians uh, within most of the political establishment, uh, there were some individuals on the right and on the left that dissented, but certainly the consensus was that the interventionist camp was correct and the anti-interventionist camp, the America Firsters, were, were, were profoundly wrong. And that, that contention was the basis of post-war American internationalism, formed the cornerstone of the rationale for US policy during the Cold War, and by extension, provided the rationale for the creation of the national security state, for the pattern of interventionism uh, that was became such an important part of US foreign policy in the 1950s, 60s, and so on. And Donald Trump runs for the presidency, and he says, that's all a lie. That's all wrong. That what, what, what ought to be the basis of U.S. policy is America first. This is, uh, in, in the eyes of the establishment, a profound heresy, denying the truth of U.S. intervention in World War II and of the pattern of so-called global leadership that continued beyond that. So, so to to, to identify with the anti-interventionists of, of the pre-World War II period was simply a, an unforgivable, mortal sin. Uh, and I think that accounts, at least in part, for the savage response of the establishment uh, to the Trump candidacy. Let me concede <laughs> quickly <laughs> that he was a liar, a fraud, a scoundrel, corrupt, <laughs> and should never have been elected president. No doubt about it. But I think in many respects, uh, it was his belief in his professed belief, who knows what he really thought, his professed belief in America first that, that put him beyond the bounds of respectability for the American political establishment. Well, he also called out the debacles uh, that the, in the name of national security had been perpetrated from Vietnam to the Middle East to everywhere else for what they were. Uh, and then, as you quote in the book, there, he's interviewed at one point about Putin, uh, who, who, and the interviewer says, well, Putin was a killer, and uh, uh and uh, Trump says, well, there are a lot of killers. Uh, we're not so innocent. Uh, so it was even beyond America first. It was, I think, naming a truth that, uh, of the, the litany of uh, disasters that had been perpetrated in the name of national security for decades. Yes. And insisting in his semi-incoherent way that those, failure, those failures deserve to be taken seriously. What I mean by that is, I don't think anybody, whether it would be Madeleine Albright or any other significant figure in the American establishment, is going to say that the United States, since it became the sole superpower, is blameless. There are few people who are going to say that the Vietnam War was a righteous cause and that it was uh, competently conducted. 
Uh, so members of the establishment will say, well, well, well yes, you know, th there were certain things that, that didn't quite turn out as we expected. But they will continue. Those miscues, failures, errors of judgment don't really matter. That, that, that what matters is the historical mission that we have as a, the we, the nation, the United States, the hi historical mission that we have been summoned to fulfill. And even if not everything has gone well, we must continue to pursue that mission. That is our calling. That is really the, the cornerstone of American exceptionalism. Uh, and, and in that sense, the critique doesn't matter. I actually think, I don't, you know, I want to go back to the 1619 thing uh, very briefly. I, I actually believe that 10 years from now, not that the 1619 project will be forgotten or that its efforts will have been to no avail, but nonetheless, my guess is that the patriotic narrative uh, will have, have been restored uh, and that the events of July 1776 uh, in, in Pennsylvania uh, will, will once again uh, drive the narrative. I don't say that because I want it to happen. I just think that, 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 that the, the desire to see ourselves as exceptional, as unique, as called upon by Providence to perform a special mission, I think it's kind of hardwired into our into our being, uh, and sadly, uh, it's likely to persist. Well, because it's a form of self-adulation, uh, and, <laughs> and it, it certainly is. and it and it uh, it dispenses with any kind of critical thinking. Uh, I, I there's so much in the book. Um, I do have to just touch on Huntington uh, because I had to live through that as a foreign correspondent, um, and you nailed him. Uh, he said, this is the clash of civilizations. Professor Huntington published an essay that uh, uh, future scholars are likely to classify among the Uratex signaling the coming demise of American primacy. Um, you said it cast a pernicious spell and underwrote the abandonment of who reason. And I, as somebody who spent seven years in the Middle East, that is so completely correct. But it, it did essentially give an ideological uh, veneer to this. Uh, it was bought. It was I can remember diplomats uh, just being almost giddy about this. And to, just speak briefly about that. Well, I think I think the broader point is that you know, ostensibly sophisticated people men and women of the world are remarkably taken in by the latest intellectual fashion. And I think you're right. When, when he published, remember the, the argument initially came out as an essay in foreign affairs, was subsequently expanded into a book. But it was the foreign affairs essay that I think uh, grabbed the attention of the policy community. And, and seem to provide uh, a fundamental answer to the question, now that the Cold War has ended, how are we to understand the composition of the world? Uh, Huntington gave an answer. Uh, it, I'll offend my political science friends by saying that because he was a political scientist, it was a greatly oversimplified answer but one that was superficially satisfying and told, told American political elites what they wanted to hear and uh, sort of uh, enabled us to begin sort of gearing up uh, for the next set of challenges. It was a cartoon vision of the world, especially of the Middle East. Uh, the, the conflicts within the Middle East were internal. I covered the Kurds. I covered the Shia. I was actually in Basra during the Shiite uprising. Uh, it, 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 it was, uh, for those of us who were on the ground in the Middle East, it was just stunningly ridiculous. And you're right, but it, but it was embraced. Well, how, why do you, let me, let me turn the tables on you. What, why, from, from the perspective of 
a foreign correspondent, that is to say, with an on-the-ground perspective, why do you think the argument had such a powerful impact? Because it it essentially, uh, I mean, this goes to Marx. It, it was the uh, it was an ideology that justified uh, military adventurism and corporate capitalism and exploitation. And uh, you know, it go it, it really wasn't that different from the white man's burden, in essence. It <laughs> it it, it uh, and it was just as simplistic and just as stupid. But but essentially, it it. Uh, I think most people think in cliches, and it was very cliche-ridden, and uh, and those cliches justified what the powerful wanted to do. I think that's why. Well, I th that strikes me as correct. And, you know, the Cold War, uh, the, the framing of the Cold War uh, relied on, on cliches, uh, relied on dumbing down complex realities and, and dumbing them down with a specific purpose in mind to, to sustain the use of American power, the, 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 the gathering up of American power. You're talking about the Middle East as we speak. I'm, I'm thinking more of, of, of Vietnam and the arguments constructed to justify massive U.S. military intervention uh, in a country that really wasn't a country. Uh, that that was of minimal interest to the United States of America, uh, and where we, you know, lost fifty eight thousand Americans and killed a couple of million other people, and then walked away. I mean, uh, it's uh, it's enough to make you weep, even all these years later. You say, consider the West the contemporary equivalent of the Holy Roman Empire that Americans of my generation once encountered in junior high world history courses. Long after events drained it of substance, the carcass of the Holy Roman Empire lingered, even if, in Voltaire's words, it was neither holy nor Roman nor an empire. The same can be said of the West. Uh, what you're talking about is a kind of edifice, almost Potemkin village, uh, that behind the walls there's nothing there. Is that where we are? Well, I tend to think so, but uh, let's acknowledge that uh, when I wrote those words, I certainly didn't anticipate that there would be a war in Ukraine uh, in, in, in 2022. That war is ongoing as you and I uh, speak. And it would appear, at least in the immediate sense, uh, that that war has given the West more specifically NATO, uh, a new life. Now, I think that uh, there is something of a fraud being perpetrated here. Uh, I, a, a, a couple of points on the Ukraine war. First of all, there's no question that this was an act of criminal aggression engineered by Vladimir Putin. There's no excusing that. Secondly, it's entirely appropriate for other nations to include the United States to provide wherewithal to Ukraine uh, to enable Ukraine, the Ukrainians to defend themselves. But third, this war was avoidable. Uh, there were opportunities for a, a diplomatic settlement uh, that would have, yes, provided for security guarantees to Russia, and yet also would have potentially enabled Ukraine to maintain its independence without this horrible uh, uh, confrontation, uh, which, is, which is still uh, unfolding. That confrontation has now created this rallying cry uh, in the West. You know, the Germans agreeing that they need to spend more on their military, uh, nations like Sweden and Finland petitioning to join NATO. And so I think we have the appearance of a rejuvenation of the West triggered by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Well, my bet is that when this war ends, and it will end, uh, that that re rejuvenation will quickly, quickly uh, disappear. Uh, and when it does, then I think we can begin 
we, the United States, uh, can begin to return to the question of what does define the world order in which we, we must play a part, in which we must be participants. And I think that the answer is going to be this, this notion of a, a West, a Western civilization of Western values providing the basis for uniting Western countries into some sort of a block that, that represents liberalism, exalted values, I think we're going to find that that was already eroding and it's, not, it's never going to come back. So what I argue in the book is preposterous to say <clears throat> that we're, we're part of the West. If you acknowledge the extent to which the United States of America has become a multi cultural nation where our people come from Latin America and from Asia and from Africa. You know, the notion that we are somehow still tied uh, to, to the so-called mother country, England, Great Britain, is, is really preposterous. Uh, but it's just going to take us a while to outgrow that, I think. Well, people have to read the book. You're a great historian and a great writer. And you do a pretty good job of taking down uh, <laughs> our fascination with the royals and uh, illusions about Great Britain. Uh, I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. You can find me at chrisedges.substack.com. Mm-hmm.